Alrighty, everybody, welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. As you're stepping inside, feel free to sit anywhere you like, folks. We're going to be starting with our show in just about four more minutes. And also, folks, just want to let you know that this show that we're about to see runs about 30 minutes long, so this is going to take us to the closing of the museum. Just make sure this is where you want to be for the last 30 minutes. I think it's a great place to be. And we have some fun space trivia questions up on screen. Try to see how many of those you can get correct before the show starts. But otherwise, we're going to get started with our show in just about four more minutes. So thank you for hanging out, everybody.
All righty, everybody, we just got it okay to start our planetarium show. So I put away those space trivia questions because now, folks, we're heading into the unknown. Ooh. And welcome, welcome, everybody, to the Morrison Planetarium. Really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I want to be your planetarium presenter. And just a heads up, I'm not just a voice coming out of the walls. I'm a person standing right behind you at the very top of the planetarium. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Good to see you. Uh, don't hurt your necks, though. Look forward into the dumb before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. Everything that you see in purple is going to be one really big screen. Thanks to the help of six different projectors hidden throughout a planetarium dome. If you're looking for a projector system, it's hidden just below that purple glow. And folks, I'm happy to announce that the show that we're doing right now is my personal favorite. This one's called Tour of the Universe, and it's so cool. Uh, pretty much with this show, uh, I'm going to be talking for the next 30 minutes, so this show's completely live. I'm going to fly us through space, and we're going to be starting off pretty close to the Earth, and we're going to be zooming all the way out to the very edge of the observable universe. So hopefully by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis of where we are in space. But uh, just a heads up, we're pretty small in the grand scheme of things. And before we get started with the show, I do have to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page and have an enjoyable time. First off, folks, there's no food or drinks allowed in. If you brought any snacks, make sure those are put away till the end. We want to keep the theater nice and clean. Thank you for doing so. Also, if you happen to have any cell phones, smartwatches, anything that produces really bright white light, now is a good time to put that away for the next 30 minutes as this can be very distracting and takes away from the plan train show experience. And folks, if you need to leave early for any reason, the exits are always going to be at the very top of the planetarium, so always make your way up the stairs to exit. And we understand that the staircase is very steep for some folks. If that poses a challenge for you, the steepness of the stairs, just remain seated. Once the show's over, we'll have a staff member escort you to a lower exit so you don't have to climb those steep stairs. And last but not least, folks, this show is very immersive thanks to our 75-foot dome above us. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, there's a really quick and easy trick to ground yourself. All you have to do is close your eyes, take in a, big few, a few big deep breaths, then your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling across the universe, at least not more than the usual. But with that being said, it looks like we're ready to go. So I invite y'all to sit back, relax, and let's begin our tour of the universe. All right, folks, as I mentioned, we're going to be starting off pretty close to the Earth, but we're starting just above it here at this really incredible spacecraft called the International Space Station, or the ISS for short. And a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, what is the International Space Station? I always hear about it in the news and articles, but... I don't really know what it is. Could you explain it for me? Well, of course, folks, the International Space Station is a research facility. It's a laboratory that orbits around our planet Earth. And they conduct all different types of experiments up here. That's a little bit further from home with less gravity. Some of the experiments that they'll conduct are things like what happens when you try to grow plants in space? Uh, do the roots grow the same with less gravity? Another one is what happens when you try to spark a match in space? Does the flame act the same? Does that act differently with less gravity as well? And my favorite, uh, personal favorite, is where they had two identical twins. One twin lived on Earth for about a year. The other one lived on the International Space Station for a year. After that year, they compare and contrast the two twins. Turns out when you live in space for a long period of time, you tend to age a little bit slower. But not only that, you also lose a lot of muscle because you don't have as much gravity working down on your muscles. So if you live in space for a long period of time, remember to exercise daily. And also, folks, the ISS looks really big here on our planetarium dome, but it's not that big in actuality. It's only about the size of an American football field. If you've never been to an American football game, don't worry. You can also use the entire California Academy of Sciences, the museum we're sitting in right now. That's about how big it is. And what's incredible is that this thing is traveling incredibly fast. It's traveling at a whopping 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes, and it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. And also, folks, this looks really far away from our planet Earth as well, but the ISS isn't too far away. It's only about 225 miles above the surface of our world. 
225 miles, that's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara. A nice little road trip to get away with the family for the weekend. So not too bad. But to tell you the truth, folks, this is as far as we put humans into space nowadays, only 225 miles above the surface of our world. And the reason why is because traveling into space is very expensive. You got to build yourself a rocket ship, buy yourself one, or pay to hitch a ride on one. And then you have to account for so much rocky fuel, you got to be able to escape the Earth's gravity. And then once you acquire that, you also take into account for all the food, water, all the air you're going to be breathing while you're up here. So the bill gets quite costly quite rapidly. But folks, the ISS is just the first stop in our tour of the universe. So now we're going to see it slowly fade away to the Earth down below. In fact, before we lose track of it, I want to add a nice little orbital path so we can see it as it slowly disappears. It looks like we're just above Vancouver and Seattle as well. So we'll see it disappear. Alrighty, folks, we're now able to see our entire planet Earth from this perspective. And I want to let you know, folks, that the space program that I'm using here inside the Morrison Planetarium is something that you can go home and download if you want to fly through space, just like how I'm doing. The space program that we're using is called Open Space. So if you go to your favorite search engine, type in Open Space Project, you'll come across a link where you can download this and you can fly through space. But just a heads up, Open Space isn't finished yet it's in its beta phase so we may come across a few bugs and glitches if we do i'll point them out hopefully we can look past them and also folks open space uses a whole lot of processing power and information so if you have an older computer you may not want to download it it may overwhelm your computer it takes up a lot of storage space as well but if you have a newer computer a gaming computer give it a try it's a whole lot of fun but if you're a person like me that doesn't want to download anything, you just want to fly through space because it's so cool, well, there's another great alternative program called NASA's Eyes. Just like the human eyeball, type in NASA's Eyes. Don't have to download anything, and you can fly through space, and it's so much fun. But in here, we're using open space. But now that we got a sense of what we're using, let's make our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. And folks, we humans have been to the moon before. This was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the, uh, the moon. They got to conduct science, and of course, they had some fun up here as well. They got to play some golf. But again, the last time we sent humans to the moon was 1972, a little more than 50 years ago or so. But don't worry, folks, we humans are making a return trip back to the moon in the next few years, thanks to NASA's new space mission in the works called Artemis. Pretty much with Artemis, NASA wants to send humans to Mars. But before we send humans deep into our solar system, we got to figure out how we're going to be living out here in space. And the moon is the perfect stepping stone how we're going to be figuring out the logistics of that. And what's really cool is that they're going to be sending the first woman to the moon. But not only that, they're also going to be sending the first person of color to the moon. But not only that, they're also going to be setting up lunar bases throughout the moon. Pretty much our technology has greatly improved in the last 50 years. So we're able to conduct much more science in a much more compactable size. And one place that we definitely want to set up a lunar base is the south pole of the moon. The reason why is because we found ice there. And ice is going to be very helpful when you're out here away from home. You can melt that ice, pass electricity through it, separate the hydrogen and the oxygen. And again, both that stuff's very valuable when you're far from home. But again, folks, look out for any news about Artemis in the coming years. We humans should be heading back to the moon relatively soon. And folks, sometimes when you're looking at the moon here from Earth, the moon feels incredibly co close. It feels like you can reach out your arms and touch it. But the moon's incredibly far away. It's about 240,000 miles away from our planet. Whew, 240,000 miles. Some of the adults in this room may have a car with that many miles on it. And if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for about four months nonstop going about 80 miles per hour. Although I wouldn't recommend it. The roads out here are poorly maintained. Hee hee hee. And from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles, 
Whew, that's like using inches to describe the distances between cities, because space is so big. Astronomers instead use a more convenient measurement known as light speed, and light, and light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it takes light only one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But at last, folks, it's time for us to leave the moon behind. So everybody say, bye-bye, moon. See you later. Oh, so cute. And now, folks, just like how we saw earlier with the International Space Station, we're going to see the moon and the Earth and their orbits as they start to slowly fade away. In fact, let me add some nice planet trails so we can keep track of everything, because, again, space is so big. And folks, on our journey today, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination, thanks to computer models like Open Space showing us the most accurate images and information available to us. And now the nearest star to us, the sun, should be coming into view. So uh, here comes the sun. Do 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 do. And also, folks, the sun is incredibly far away as well. It's about 93 million miles away from our planet Earth. Whew, 93 million miles. That's a good distance away. Now, in order for sunlight to travel that distance at the speed of light, it only takes sunlight about eight and a half minutes at the speed of light to travel that 93 million miles. So again, we're the Earth, third rock from the sun. And this is a really cool concept, folks, because let's say the sun was to turn off all of a sudden. It was no more, no longer emitting light. That last bit of sunlight will travel that 93 million miles, that eight and a half minutes towards Earth. And then all of a sudden, the daytime on Earth would become nighttime. And again, this is such a cool concept to keep in mind. Because let's say we're looking at a star that's 70 light years away from us. We're looking at that star as it looked like 70 years ago. Because the light that just reached us took 70 years to get to us. So when you look at really far away objects in space, it's kind of like looking back in time in a sense, which is so cool. But now that we have a nice bird's eye view of our solar system, let's do a quick refresher. Right in the middle of our solar system, we have the biggest thing, our star, the sun. Closest planet to the sun, we have Mercury. Then we have Venus, Earth, that's us. And then Mars, the red planet. And of course, past Mars, we have this really cool thing called the asteroid belts. And this is what it looked like to highlight all those asteroids. There's roughly about a million asteroids in the asteroid belt. And then past the asteroid belt, you have the really big planets, the gas giants, the Jovians. We've got Jupiter, the largest of them all, right behind. Saturn, famous for its rings. And then over here we have the icy gas giants, Uranus, the funny one, and Neptune. And of course we can add everyone's favorite and lovable dwarf planet, Pluto. So here comes the orbit of Pluto on the right side of our screen over here. And a lot of people don't realize that Pluto hangs out here in this outer part of our solar system called the Kuiper Belt. And a few of you are probably wondering to yourself, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that before. Well, folks, this is the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt's like a second asteroid belt past the orbit of Neptune, and you're mostly going to find icy asteroids out here in short period comets, comets that don't stray too far away from the sun. And what's really incredible is that uh, in 2006, our technology greatly improved, and we were able to see much smaller objects way out here in the outer part of our solar system. And we found more than 400 objects. Some of this stuff was bigger than Pluto. So we couldn't call all these things planets. There was just way too many of them. So all the astronomers on planet Earth had a great big meeting. They had to figure out what exactly you need to be to be considered a planet. And folks, that was the day in 2006 where they came up with three criteria. And that was the day that Pluto went from being a planet to a dwarf planet. And I know a lot of people have hard feelings about Pluto becoming a dwarf planet, but that's the really cool thing about science, because as our technology improves, we're able to observe things, make better measurements, and then we can reclassify things. Uh, so science is constantly updating and changing, and that's the really cool thing. But I want to put away the Kuiper Belt, because that's just a whole lot to look at. 
And I want to be adding on screen some of the many different spacecrafts we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system. And now on screen we have the trajectories of Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2, and the latest of them all, New Horizons, which did a quick flyby of Pluto in 2015. You can see that interaction by Pluto. And all of these spacecrafts are all traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventurers, Voyager 1, has not traveled as far as light travels in a single day. In order for sunlight to travel to the orbit of Pluto, it takes sunlight about five hours at the speed of light. Five hours. Whew, that's a good distance away. But now, folks, it's time for us to leave our planetary scale behind us because now we're going to be heading out into interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us about four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. Oh, hey, look at that. Alpha Centauri is just on our left-hand side. So you can see that star that's moving really close. Again, we're right in the middle of our screen. That's our solar system. Alpha Centauri is going to be the one moving closest to the left. And again, folks, four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us. But that doesn't really put into perspective of how long it would take us humans to travel that distance. Folks, if you're getting a rocket ship today, made your way over to Alpha Centauri. It's going to take you about 8,500 years to make that trip. Whew. And that's just a one-way trip. <laughs> but let's stop considering whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because now, folks, we're going to be stepping inside something called the radiosphere. And again, we're now inside something called the radiosphere, and this represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted or rather leaked into space, and it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting out from the Earth. This first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, radar signals, and then later, the detonation of atomic weapons. All this stuff is emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. And folks, humans were broadcasting well before that, uh, before the 1930s, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. And since all these signals are electromagnetic, they are traveling at the speed of light. So this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radiosphere is constantly expanding at the rate of one light year per year, so is anybody out there listening? And now, folks, I'm going to be adding some many markers onto the screen. These many markers indicate some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 30 years, which has at least one or more planets orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. So far today, we found more than 5,000 confirmed exoplanets in the nearby vicinity to us. 5,000 of the worlds besides our own. And that 5,000 number is going to be increasing as the years continue because we have space telescopes where their whole purpose is to find as many exoplanets as possible. In fact, if you look towards the center of our screen, you can see that we point our space telescopes in that one direction and we found a whole heap of exoplanets. So as you can imagine, as they scan more and more of the night sky, we'll be finding exoplanets left and right. Now, to say if any of them are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it, well, we cannot answer that question quite yet. Pretty much new space telescopes are being developed for that exact purpose, so we've got a little while before they're launching into space and conducting science. But the more important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radiosphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. Now, to give you an example, let's say we live in a star system over here on the left side of our dome, inside the radio sphere. We find an alien civilization somewhere on the right side. Let's say this over here. We shoot them a text message. We say, hey, we're humans. What are y'all up to? Take 60 years to get to them. They listen in, answer back. Another 60 years to get their return message. Folks, that is a 120-year conversation in the making. And I can barely wait for a text message from my friend. Hee hee hee. 
But of course, folks, planetary systems beyond the radio sphere, more than 90 light years away, have not heard from us yet, but eventually they will, as the radio sphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. And for now, I'm going to be putting away our exoplanet markers, but I'm going to leave our radio sphere up on screen, because as huge as humanity's electromagnetic footprint is, it is nothing compared to our Milky Way galaxy. Alright folks, we're now looking down at our Milky Way galaxy, and I've got to ask, can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> Just kidding, we're too far away. And folks, our Milky Way galaxy is so incredibly huge, if you wanted to cross it from one side to the other, it's going to take you about 130,000 years at the speed of light. It is big. And the Milky Way is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small, small neighborhood in this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave it, I want to show you what it looks like from the side. You're going to notice that our Milky Way galaxy kind of looks like a big flat pancake. It kind of looks like a frisbee in space. And this is going to come important in a little bit later on in the show, because when scientists and astronomers want to learn about the universe, it's so much more easier for them to point their uh, telescopes galactically north and galactically south. Instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way, right towards the middle, where you have stars, planets, gas, debris, things that block their view of the universe. So again, we like to point our telescopes galactically north and south. Keep that in mind, that's going to come important in just a little bit. And folks, the Milky Way galaxy is only one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise a known universe. So in this giant leap, every uh, you're now seeing a view where every point of light represents not a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy. Each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of stars. And we live in a local galaxy group, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small. Also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda Galaxy. Only 2 million light years away, just next door and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And as we continue expanding out, folks, you're now going to realize that galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large groups and clusters, or they create voids where there's very few or no galaxies at all. So we can see a nice galaxy clustering towards the center. We can see some towards the bottom of our screen as well. We can see very few galaxies towards the top of our dome. So you can kind of think of galaxies like people. They like to hang out together or they like to avoid each other. And folks, the f this picture that we're now looking at represents the closest 30,000 galaxies to us in a space over 300 million light years across. We got to give thanks to an amazing uh, astronomer by the name of Dr. Brent Tully, who worked at the University of Hawaii and compiled this amazing representation over decades of time with other astronomers working aside him. So big shout out to Dr. Brent Tully. I love flying through this galactic map. But now, folks, we have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. So now we're about to see the very large scale structure of the universe. Remember, folks, every single point of light that you're seeing that's not a star, that's an individual galaxy. And by the way, the large-scale structure of the universe is not in the shape of a bow tie or a butterfly. Remember when I just mentioned that we live in a big flat spiral disk of the Milky Way? Well, if it had lined up our Milky Way, it would line up just down the middle like so. And again, we like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south instead of looking to the plane of the Milky Way. But astronomers still wanted to make sure that there was galaxies through the plane. So we have this nice purple survey of galaxies. You'll notice that they were still able to find them, just not as many and not as far. Pretty much we had to wait for our technology to improve. And once that happens, we'll be able to map out all these areas that haven't been filled in yet. So it's just a matter of time. And ooh, look at the time. We're almost out of time. So let's continue pressing on, folks, because now we're going to be encountering these really distant, faraway objects known as the quasars. 
and the quasars are going to be represented by nice orange dots on either side of the large scale structure of the universe. And the quasars are short for quasi stellar radio sources. These blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, you're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before quasars, before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we're about to see the very edge of the observable universe. And here we are at the very edge of the observable universe, folks. And what we're looking at is something called the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. And all evidence indicates that the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. This is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And this is a picture, a baby version of the universe, only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And this isn't your typical photo either. Instead, this is a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color-coded with the light areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions and those darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. And these fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But eventually, these really tiny differences gave rise to that large-scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping of clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, folks, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us to go, so we only have one direction left to go. That's going to be back towards planet Earth. So let's find a nice entry point through all these quasars and galaxies. Ooh, this looks like a good spot. And let's make our return trip back to planet Earth, everybody. All right, everybody, we're crossing an expanse of over 13 billion light years. We present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. We live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. And with that thought, folks, I want to remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to peer into their telescopes and see into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But it looks like we just made our way back into our Milky Way galaxy. We just headed straight for that radiosphere. We're making our way back to our star system, our solar system, our tiny neighborhood in the vastness of space. And now, folks, we're about to pass those spacecrafts we sent down in the 1970s to explore the solar system, passing the orbit of Pluto and the Kuiper Belt region, and making our way to the third rock from the sun, our homeworld, our, uh, our little blue marble, uh, planet Earth. All the people that we know and love 
and we ever learned about in history all existed on this one planet. And now, folks, we're about to pass the orbit of the moon, the furthest we've ever sent humans out into outer space. And as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, folks, this is going to be the end of our Tour of the Universe show. If you want to share this show with somebody that wasn't able to see it today, you can check out this exact show on the on the Morrison Planetarium's Facebook page or our YouTube channel, and you can share the show with them. But otherwise, it looks like we made it back home safe and sound, just in time for dinner time. And uh, that's all the time we have today, folks. Thanks for stopping by, and make sure to get home safely.